Ladies and gentlemen, it's Hot Legs, straight from the Wine Exchange, with wine expert, Kyle Meyer. It's time for another Hot Legs. Now, I don't know how to say hot legs in German, but if I could, I would. Because today we're focusing on uh, three of the finest German Rieslings that I know of, from three of the top producers, not just of Riesling, but of white wine in the world. Uh, we're going to focus on three different areas of Germany today. And we're going to focus on one vintage and one particular sweetness level of German wine. Because uh, what's your perception of German wine? Do you think it's all sweet? Well, you know, fact of the matter is most of it isn't. Most of, the, most of the wine produced in Germany uh, is in fact dry and is drunk you know, in Germany and in the European countries. But uh, most of the sweet wine that Germany produces gets exported to the U.S. And that's why the U.S. has this preconceived notion that all German wines are sweet. Now, in my personal opinion, I think German sweet wines are better than German dry wines. I love the, the, the richness that the residual sugar, the fruitiness carries, and I think it carries the flavors in the palate more. I think some of the dry German wines can be a bit too stoic and lean and mean, and a lot of the importers feel the same way. And that's specifically why the American importers that we work with, the top ones, uh, bring in very little dry German wine. That being said, there is great dry German wine, but today we're focusing on some of the lightly fruity stuff. Now, we're not going to go sweet. We're not going to go dessert style. We're just going to focus on what do you think are the perfect fruitiness levels for, uh, for a number of cuisines and for everyday drinking. So we're going to start today with the uh, Gunderloch winery. Now, all these wines are what we call cabinet level wines. The German Quality Wine Control Board uh, sets up several levels of sweetness, and they're all named, so everyone kind of knows what they're getting into when they're dealing with the particular German wines that they see on the shelf, because the labels can be daunting. Even in Germany, the labels can be quite confusing. Today, we're focusing on the cabinet level sweetness wines, which are the, basically the driest of the, what, what they consider the fruity style wines. These wines have just a little trace of residual sugar. Uh, when you have them with food, they almost taste dry. But when you have them on their own as an aperitif, they do have that light little hint of fruitiness that we really love. And they're perfect wines for the holidays, uh, particularly when you're doing the, the ham thing, you know, honey baked ham and yams and all that kind of deal. These wines marry perfectly. We're going to start with the Gunderloch Estate. Gunderloch is the greatest producer of wine in the Rhein-Hessen area uh, uh, of Germany. And they own several very special vineyard sites. And this wine comes from two of those sites. The Nockenheimer Rotenberg site and the Niersteiner Pettenthal site. Uh, they're both planted to 100% Riesling, which is exactly what this wine is. And this wine all the wines you see on the table see no new oak barrels, no small oak barrels. These are all done in, in stainless steel or maybe in, in larger, much larger neutral wood barrels uh, to protect the vibrancy and the acidity and the crispness and the flavor and the delicacy of the wines. Because um, uh, most people consider Riesling to be the most transparent grape variety in the world, i.e. it conveys that sense of terroir, that sense of place finer than, than any other grape variety out there, except some people might argue Chardonnay, but mm, my nod goes to Riesling. Fritz and Agnes Hasselbach uh, owned a Gunderlock estate. Heavily uh, sloping vineyards that lead straight down into the river. Uh, classic, the red soil characters you get from uh, Riesling from Gunderlock. Um, uh, there's a hint of apricot, and you get uh, some tropical flavors like some citrus, uh, mandarin, a touch of mineral. Mm, these are low alcohol. I can swallow this one. No more than 10 points, any of these wines today, by the way. Very easy drinking. The beauty of this wine is they make it in what they call a half dry or a halb trocken style. That means there's just a little bit of residual sugar, actually less sugar in this wine than in the next two wines. So once you do have this with food, it basically becomes bone dry. And I love that. I mean, this is killer aperitif style wine that you can have almost any time of the day. Poolside for those rough California winters. Mmm. Mmm, love that. Next one. Ah, Fritz Hag. Actually, it's not Fritz Hag anymore. The estate's called Weingut Fritz Hag. Uh, but now today, nowadays, it's um, run by Oliver Hogg, who's uh, one of the youngest, most talented winemakers working in the Mosel area of Germany today. Now, the Mosel is the most famous wine region in Germany, right? Everyone's heard of Mosel wine. That's where you got your um, um, uh, peace porters from. God, you know, who hasn't had a glass of Peace Porter in their lives. This is grown just north of the town of Peaceport, and is one of the finest vineyard sites in all the Mosel, the Braunenberger Ufer. 
Here the slopes are precipitous. We're talking like up to 73% grades here. I mean, we're talking this, where one false move on these loose slaty soils, and you go bouncing straight down in the Mosul River. I was in uh, one part of the Mosul one time. They actually had a cemetery at the bottom of the vineyard. And, and, and I was like, what's that all about? And the guy was saying, well, you know, when the harvesters fall, they just go doop, 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 boom. And we just, you know, cover them up and move on. He was kidding, of course, but unbelievable. Anyway, uh, wow, Oliver Hogg knows how to make wine. He cut his teeth in another famous winery called Vegeler and then came back to work at, the, at his father's estate. And here you get that green apple character, the lime, the key lime, and those slaty tones, that soily, wonderful soil character. Mm. Noticeably sweeter, but I don't mind. And here we're only talking 8% alcohol. And oh, here comes that backlash of flavor. The, those, those, it's like lime sorbet and stones and minerals and Mm, here comes the tropical citrus fruits. Incredibly good on its own, but yet amazingly versatile, a number of cuisines. I mean, these wines can go with almost anything, people. Um, asparagus soup, a uh, big plate of ham, uh, Szechuan, Thai, um, Alsatian-type cuisines, you know, charcut plates, you name it. Man, these are good. I, in case you didn't know, <laughs> I like German wine. Jeez, turn out my cheerleader here. All right, the last one on the table, uh, Muller Cattoir. So we went for the Rheinhessen, then we went to the Mosul. Now we're going to another famous wine region called the Fouts. And in the Fouts, it's actually a bit more south. It's slightly warmer than these other two areas. So, in fact, you have a little more richness in the wines. They, um, maybe a little less acid. These wines have a little more cut to them. And this one is a little more broader on the palate generally because of the, both the region and the soils. The soil, there's less slate and stone in the soil. It's more of like a clayey, um, uh, loamy, what the, the Germans used to term Luss, uh, soil. And Muller Cattoir is arguably the finest producer in the Fouts. This guy is great. And uh, Heinrich Cattoir recently hired a new winemaker, Martin Frenzen, to make the wines. Uh, young Turk, brilliant kid. Uh, he's making fabulous dry wines there, which, as I said earlier, I'm usually not a dry wine fan. I'll drink his dry wines. They're awesome. And, uh, but he's still keeping true to the classic cabinet style wine. This is from the Musbacher Esselshaut Vineyard, which is considered a really good site in the Fouts. Probably not considered like a grade A site, but imagine like a grade B site in the hands um, of, a, of a top chef. You know, it's um, Thomas Keller making macaroni and cheese, you know, that sort of thing. It'll be the best damn macaroni and cheese you ever had. Mm, this is classic. Here we have more um, apricot and we got more stone fruits, uh, uh, peaches, white peaches. Um, that really comes through, less citrus. Mm, easy to get lost in that wine. Quite spicy, spicier than these two. More of that baking spice, um, apple pie, little hint of cinnamon sneaking its way in there. There is a minerality, but it's kind of like a brown soiliness, which is just kind of like a, a slight underpinning to the, to the really big beefy fruit flavors in this wine. It's the, probably the richest of the three wines in the table. Uh, but it's more your mood, you know, do you want something a little richer? Do you want something a little brighter and snappier? Or do you want to play the difference with maybe a little less sugar in there? Regardless, these are three of the top German Rieslings for the price. All these, uh, on our shelf at least, are south of $20, making them some of the finest white wine values in the world. Enjoy.